lecture, chapter 13, O oh, intro. Relevant, relevant. This song actually uh, was used, in, it was an album by Pink Floyd, The Wall. This is the song is called Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2. Yes, there is a Part 1. There is a Part 3. Uh, the album was released in 1979. Uh, and in, in shortly thereafter, in the uh, 1980s, was used uh, in South Africa to protest uh, discrimination in education. You know, it's an apartheid country. Uh, racially segregated, stratified society, right? Um, with white people having man, uh, full rights and citizenship and black people being put in a marginalized situation. Um, in some places it's different. In California, there's been that hi history of that with Latinos, Asians, um, you know. But today, speaking of apartheid, speaking of the separation of um, as far as physically being separated, uh, which is an interesting concept, but we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the sectional conflict in America leading up to the Civil War. It relates to slavery. Uh, it also relates to uh, the slavery issue being brought up because land is going to be acquired from Mexico in a war. So you have the issue of of, of land that was once part of Mexico and is now the United States, including where we are right now and the sort of, you know, marginalized status arguably of, of, um, Mexican Americans and Chicano Americans, Latinos, whatever, you know, whatever folks prefer to be called. Um, what's interesting about the idea of apartheid of separate, of separating these different groups is that segregation is, was segregation after the civil war is really the separation part between blacks and whites in the South during the civil war. Or before the Civil War, in the in what's called the antebellum, uh, anti a n t e b e l l u m antebellum, anti is in pre. Before, right? You ante up in poker. Um, the anti pasta is an appetizer. You know, uh, during the antebellum period when slavery was illegal, uh, that was probably the time in which whites, whites and blacks, at least in the South, probably just in the country in general had the most contact with each other, right? Uh, is, this is not necessarily a good thing because you have a situation where one, the, the contact is entirely based on the supremacy of one in law over the other, which especially specifically in relation to ma male and female relations, white male and black female relations. That creates a very serious problem uh, for, you know, African-American women. But let's talk about how the slavery issue uh, and, the, and by the slavery issue, we need to be very clear. The Civil War was about slavery. Anybody who tells you otherwise is wrong. This is not a debate. This isn't really a debatable thing. There's a lot of, cons of, a lot of people out there for various reasons uh, that want to separate this slavery issue from the Southern cause. It's because the Southern cause is a state's rights issue. And so people running around today talking about state's rights and local government, um, there's a long history of that being linked to white supremacy, including in the South in this time period. So people want to separate, uh, and they'll throw at you really some some things that on the surface sound interesting, but can e just you know send me an email. I can easily help you out in disproving them, or not disproving them, but showing you how they're misleading stats or facts or anything. Um, but the, I'm rambling now. The other side, though, on the other side, the, just because I'm saying the Civil War was about slavery, I'm not saying that the North was morally superior to the South in that they accepted black people as equal citizens. Uh, that is not true. There were just as many racists in the South, or in the North, as there are in the South. They have just as many issues. Lincoln, actually, the land of Lincoln, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln's from, uh, did not allow free blacks to vote, had very strict migratory laws about blacks coming into the state. Um, the, the, the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, the segregation in, in public schools decision was the precedent for that, for that case was actually two cases involving California and segregation against Latinos and Asians. And 
the Board of Education in Brown versus the Board of Education was in Kansas. It's Brown v. Board, Brown, Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. Kansas was a free state, which is going to be discussed in Chapter 13. So the entire Supreme Court case that dealt with ending segregation in public schools in the southern part of the United States really stood on the ground of segregation in the West, on the West Coast. In the West, yeah. That's pretty good, actually. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so the when we say the Civil War is about slavery, what we're saying is, see all this gray over here? Alta California. Let's go to full screen. Isn't that a great map? Ah, Alta California. This used to be Mexico. This all used to be Mexico. Right here. Uh, this gray area, when it's acquired from Mexico, uh, reopens the slavery issue. Remember the Louisiana Purchase, right? All of all of this stuff in here. Um, all of this stuff. That the issue of slavery there was settled by the Missouri Compromise. What's going to happen when territory is acquired from Mexico? The issue of slavery is going to come back up shortly thereafter. The agreement in the Missouri Compromise that dealt with the Louisiana Purchase is going to be itself compromised. People are going to try to go around, get rid of it with something else. The, issue, the idea is you have all of this land here. People want to move there. Businesses, there's mining, railroads, all sorts of possible endeavors that could happen here. Not to mention the fact that average people want to move out here and live on their own piece of land with their families. Now, if slavery is allowed there, all of these folks in the South they, they, the North thinks we'll move over here to the gray area, buy up all the good land or settle on good land, work it with slave labor. There won't be any jobs. And once they start working land with slave labor, you know, that it's a, it's going to be predominantly agricultural. There's not going to be any sort of, you know, uh, lumber industry or mining industry or, uh, you know, for, for coal or silver, whatever, whatever, you know, quicksilver, all sorts of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. So the main the the main issue is some people, for example, some people will tell you the tariff. The Civil War was about tariffs, which is uh, which is complete. It's it's just stupid. It's really it's insanely inaccurate, um, because the tariff was the Republicans in 1860 when Lincoln is elected president. He's not even president yet. He's not even able to change the tariff, and the Confederate states, the Southern states, have already rebelled and they've already formed their own country. So that's silly, but it, just for the sake of argument, just for the sake of argument, right? Let's say the, tar okay, tariffs were the reason for the war. The primary reason was tariffs. Tariffs, slavery influenced people's views on tariffs, right? In the South, tar tariffs, this is what tariffs do. They protect, man they protect American products, manufactured products mostly. So people involved in the North in manufacturing textiles in the early industrialization process, they wanted protective tariffs because they were directly in, in, in invested in, in um, working for a, a company or owning a company. In the South, which is predominantly agricultural, they don't see the need for that at all. So, and this is a generalization. There are people in the South who were, you know, supported stronger tariffs, and people in the North who wanted weaker tariffs. There's variation on this, but this is a general thing. So, slavery really defined the way that North and South evolved as societies. Does that mean that one was better than the other or morally superior? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I would not say that for, as a teacher, but the slavery issue does define them as two different groups, two different regions developing differently, which eventually comes to conflict in this area. So we have the idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is a term that comes around in the 1840s. The idea, we have the United States, which starts over here in the white, right? It's 13 colonies. Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence. No, not in the Declaration. I'm sorry. Maybe. Jefferson, it was in 1790. It was much later. My apologies. Jefferson believed that Native Americans, their only hope for their own civilization was to move west beyond the Mississippi. The Mississippi River is right in here somewhere. <laughs> to move beyond there, right? Ethnic cleansing. This is ethnic cleansing. The idea was is that this is a Protestant, 
This is a Anglo, right? Anglo nation. This is ethnic nationalism. We talked about it. During the 1840s, territorial expansion came to be seen as proof of the innate superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race. And it, this is something that's happening from the founding of this country, but the idea of manifest destiny uh, states that, or believes that America is destined, right? Destiny. We are destined to occupy the entire continent. Right? The, uh, John Winthrop from uh, once gave a, a mentioned the idea of a shining city on a hill that Plymouth, Plymouth for the Massachusetts Bay Colony would be an example for the world, a light for the world. In Manifest Destiny, we have, okay, we've, we've, we've settled here. We've set this example for the world. But instead of just leading by example, we're actually just going to take over a huge part of the world, right? We're, we, we're the ones that are living the right way. We are Christian. We are living in a free market society. They thought, you know, relatively speaking, in a democratic society, this is the best society you could possibly have. Obviously, this is mostly white guys saying this. Um, but so if there are people in the way, if there are people West, if there are Native Americans, if there's Spanish territory, later Mexican territory, right? We know that God wants us to, to, to conquer this, these people, to take this land, to make it a part of the United States because the United States is so much better, right? Similar situation to, to the way that Native Americans were dealt with, the idea with it, that, that we're using, we can use the land better in, because we can, we, are, we can develop it in ways in a capitalist society that has not been done in Native American society. So bigger, right, bigger. Bigger is not always better. That's what she said. Okay, cut that part out. Um, anyways. So let's cut through this. Texas independence. Texas becomes in the Texas actually becomes independent uh, in 1836. Texas is its own country for nine years. The Lone Star Republic. Uh, it had it was once a part of Mexico. When Mexico achieves independence from Spain in 1821, there the Mexican Empire nation runs from the California border with Oregon, which is right up here all the way down to present-day Panama, way down in Central America. And there's some pockets, but it, it's all connected. It's one of the 10 largest continuous empires in the history of humanity, right? But it only lasts very briefly. See, 15 years after their independence, uh, a group of white Americans, which had been immigrating into Texas, remember that, white Americans are migrating, immigrating, into Texas and breaking the law when they get there because they're bringing slaves. Slaves, slavery is outlawed in Mexico in 1829. So in the 1830s, white Americans are crossing the border into Mexico and breaking the law. Just remember that. Just remember that. Hashtag Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, there was also some issue with, the, if, at first, these, these settlers, this is where we get the Alamo from. Remember the Alamo, right? You have these, these, these Sam Houston and, and Bowie, and not David Bowie, Jim Bowie, I think his name was, uh, Davy Crockett, right? Or is it da Davy Crockett? Yeah, all these guys, right? And all these different folks are, are, are coming into um, Texas, acquiring land. Many of them are bringing slaves, which is illegal. There's issues with uh, paying taxes on the land, I believe, or, and then the, then the Mexican government, and which had originally welcomed this idea. They thought, hey, some Americans, some wealthy Americans are going to come in, and yeah, this is cool. We'll make some money off of the land, and blah, blah, blah. Eventually, they see this is a situation where these folks could end up becoming a, 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 a take, taking over, becoming very wealthy and powerful, right, uh, within this part of, part of the land, part of the continent that's Mexico. Uh, sound familiar? So there's conflict there. Uh, eventually, you know, this army of Santa Ana does the whole Alamo thing, um, where these Americans are refusing. They're, they're they're basically they're basically breaking the law. They're refusing to comply with the requests of the Mexican government. This conflict ensues, and this group of the Alamo is wiped out. After you know, this group of the Alamo, there's a battle or something, and they're wiped out. 
Uh, eventually, though, there's uh, they the these these Americans, many Amer many other Americans too, probably join them. They organize, they uh, defeat defeat the Mexican Army of Santa Ana. They end up declaring independence in Texas, which is where the Texas flag is right here. It's not the original borders of Texas. Okay, they declare a Lone Star Republic, which lasts for nine years. At which point, it is annexed. Texas is annexed, annexation in 1845. After the election of James K. Polk, James K. Polk is president throughout this annexation, and then into the Mexican-American War. Uh, James K. Polk. I'm actually using ear earbuds ear, uh, with a microphone that are Polk. They're not designed by his family, though. He was just a president. So this is, this fits into this idea of manifest destiny. Around actually around 1845 is the is the time where the actual phrase manifest destiny started getting used uh, and the idea that let's just keep pushing let's just keep pushing we're gonna we need to get all the way to the Pacific and, and don't worry who's in the way God wants us to do this right so um, Texas becomes independent but this is the original Texas right it's much smaller and then there's this wonderful river right here where the current border is called the Rio Grande and way over here, Texas has or Mexico is still in possession of California. Uh, they had not discovered gold in California yet. California has is has the um, with the San Francisco Bay and other areas. It's a very it's a very vital uh, port region, right? Remember, across this ocean, you have Asia, which is going if you if you. A few generations after this in 17b, you'll learn about how the Philippines and China and Japan and all these countries, the U.S. comes into contact with all these countries, right? And it's, it's, it's related to the same thing, expansion, the economy is expanding, the population is expanding, the country is expanding in, 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 in size and then its influence around the world. Um, and so California is really an essential uh, seen as a very essential place. It's also it's you know it's 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 a very fertile place. There's a lot of, of of crops that are produced in California, not the same ones that we produce today. The the two biggest crops in California are grapes and pot, um, but you know there used to be a lot of other stuff too. So so we the United States wants all just wants all this territory and wants access and this manifest destiny thing fits into the fact that California is known to be a valuable place. So, uh, and also we want, we just want more territory and we want Texas to be a little bigger. So we send troops, uh, with a guy named Zachary Taylor, who's a general in the army. And we cross over this border. We basically say to the, to Mexico, Hey, we think the border is to the Rio Grande. That's where the Texas border is. Mexico says no. So we march troops across the, into this disputed area. Uh, knowing that it would potentially provoke a fight, which it does. And that's how the Mexican-American War starts. It's a land grab. It's basically a land grab. There's no United Nations back then to condemn it. There's no global council, right? Even if there were, they, we probably wouldn't listen to them anyways. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's not as if uh, the, the folks in California don't really identify with the government in Mexico City, which is way down here, right? Cal Californians refer to themselves as Californios. Um, Pijo Pico is the last governor of California under when it's part of Mexico. It's only been a part of Mexico really for 20 years, right? It's, it was Spain before that. They don't really identify. I mean, this is really far from from like San Francisco, San Jose. Let's go with San Jose. San Jose, which is a town incorporated, it's established in 1777. So 1845, 46, this is 75 years later, roughly. Uh, there's a long distance between San Jose and Mexico City. It's a six-hour flight. It's like flying to New York. So six, a six-hour flight by today. They didn't have planes back then. Um, so there's this border dispute. The army of Zachary Taylor is up here fighting, uh, I believe, against Santa Ana initially. And Santa Ana is an interesting guy. He's almost like a he's almost like a a, 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 a Pancho Villa type or a 
uh, Zapata type where they they're regionally uh, they control a, a, fa a, a faction right or what you call parochial they're maybe regional or they maybe have a strong support but not a majority support there's a Mexican government which is very um, disorganized in some ways uh, and and so in some you know Santa Ana is, is, has the military power and so his role as general but also as a political leader is really fuzzy um, it's a interesting place so it's an interesting situation and they're very they're vulnerable basically too to uh, something like this from the US so Zachary Taylor's army is up here fighting Santa Ana it's not going swiftly right it does we don't just march straight down into Mexico City uh, I can't remember exact the exact cir circumstances but they're bogged down basically so we decide to launch an amphibious invasion amphibious meaning over water similar to what the uh, like the Allied invasion in D-Day on a smaller scale we basically sail from New Orleans all right which is in Louisiana sail from New Orleans down we land in Veracruz this army is under the command of General Winfield Scott um, Serving in this army with him is also a young Robert E. Lee, who is going to be a Confederate general. Uh, lots of generals from the Civil War. This is the only combat experience they had. This is the only, other than a handful of Indian wars that some of them fought. This is the only combat experience that a lot of folks have. Grant, Lee, on both sides, North and South. Stonewall Jackson, Beauregard, um, Meade, all sorts of folks. Okay, so this, uh, Winfield Scott's army lands at Veracruz, marches in, wins several battles on its way to Mexico City, eventually occupies Mexico City in 1847. And a peace treaty is signed in 18... Uh, I should have gone to this slide. Huh. Let's, so I already, already wrote this. And this, this part here up top is true. This is a... Uh, the Mexican-American War is basically like we, we say casually, well, this used to be part of Mexico. There was this little war that was fought. This is a very, in many ways, still a very bitter uh, part of history for Mexico. They lost a huge amount of territory, about a third of their country. Uh, and, and there are, you know, how pe people say that uh, Cinco de Mayo is, a, is an American holiday. It's not really celebrated in Mexico, right? It's a Mexican-American holiday. Um, that, that's somewhat true. There are streets named after Cinco de Mayo, right, in the main center city square of, of Mexico City. Uh, but nothing is it, there. Are, the monuments you'll see for the Mexican American War or the Mexican War, the monuments you see, I mean, Mexico City is under siege. The U.S. Army invades it and occupies their capital, right? There are monuments everywhere. There's a monument called, let's look for it, it's the Los. Los Niños heroes. It's the six children. These apparently these six, they were in like a youth brigade uh, at um, Chapultepec, which is like the, his castle in Mexico City that was converted into a fort. And these six youths, they were kind of like in an auxiliary, apparently helped to defend uh, Mexico City and fell to their death from this. It's just, you know sort of mar it martyred them basically. They were martyrs for Mexico for the cause of defending Mexico City, and. Um, they they have statues all over. Well, let me see if I can find it's it's the Los Niños. Let me really quick. Bear with me. Los Niños heroes. Yes. There we go. See this Dia de los Niños heroes, child heroes or heroic cadets. The day honors heroes of the eighteen forty seven Battle of Chapultepec. I said it right. During the Mexican American War. I actually have some pictures of Chapultepec. I was there. Um, if you want some, I can send them. We can just look it up right now, but we'll do that later. I'll, I'll, I'll share my picture in an email because I got some decent ones. It's really beautiful, actually. Um, okay. So, Mexico City is occupied in September of 1847. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is February of 1848. It's a few months later, right? There's a military victory after which diplomats go to work. We send in diplomats, people who today would come from the State Department, who negotiate a treaty. In this treaty, uh, Cal uh, 
Mexico in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. They are militarily defeated. Their city, their capital city is occupied. They have really have very little choice. They sign over in this treaty for a nominal fee. I think it was a few, few million dollars. Let me see. Let's look that one up because I want to be sure. I'm going to say another, it's 15 million. The Louisiana Purchase was 15 million. Um, cost of price for territory. Uh, uh oh, I'm not seeing it here. Look it up somewhere. It's a, it's a huge amount of land. We didn't pay a lot for it. Hey, that's me again. That's not me. In the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico cedes. They they surrender control over to the United States. California, Colorado, Utah, parts of New Mexico, parts of Wyoming, parts of Arizona, and the rest of the other area of Texas, right? So um, California had actually had whites living there, white Americans who had revolted and had a bear, what's called a bear flag revolt. And for less than a year, they were, they were their own country too. So they actually had their own thing going. And then they were annexed, you know, in this, in this treaty, basically, they became a part of the United States, right? This is a massive amount of land. All, a lot of it is below the Mason-Dixon line, right, where slavery can still exist. So the uh, acquisition of new land reopened the question of slavery's expansion. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there's, which, this is, this is congressional debate, right? What should we do with this new territory? An early one was the Wilmot Proviso. It's, it's named after David Wilmot, which basically says no slavery in any of this territory, right? Strangle slavery. We're gonna, we're, it's almost like the policy of containment against the Soviet Union in the 20th century. Like containment of, this is what Lincoln believed. You contain slavery where it exists. And um, at some point it's gonna just have to, they're gonna have to change, they're gonna have to end slavery. They're not gonna be, have, they're gonna have less political power in the federal government. You know, so slave owners wanna keep pushing west and, and expanding slavery. The Wilmot Proviso says no slavery in any of this territory. You know, whatever, whatever becomes a state eventually, slavery can exi can't, it cannot exist. Um, that is not passed. It's way too controversial. It's way too radical. It's what's called way, uh, radical Republican eventually. These guys are Whigs, but I shouldn't go into that even. What happens is the Compromise of 1850. How long is this hangout? How long have I been filming? This is probably way too long.